Welcome everyone. The subject tonight is the deep self within and the background of the subject is uh, the chaos in the world, the extreme things happening in terms of climate crisis on one hand and cultural crises on the other hand, so that we live in this very unusual time in which things can turn upside down at any moment and no one really knows what's going to happen next. And surprisingly, perhaps, there's an old idea that um, when everything is falling apart, the deeper self within a person is closer to the surface. And that idea um, was picked up by Carl Carl Jung, who was bringing the idea of depth psychology to the modern world and also bringing all these uh, images and ideas from cultures around the world having to do with the deeper self inside. And so I'll be drawing on some of his ideas and images from around the world in order to try to constellate this sense that there is a deeper self and soul inside each one of us And when the world outside is falling apart, the instinctive thing to do, the psychological thing to do, and ultimately the mythological thing to do is to turn inside. And when a person does that, it's very helpful to have the notion that there's something deep and wise inside each person that tries to become known throughout the course of life. So that's the kind of uh, outline of the background and the journey. And I want to begin with the poem, um, a Rumi poem, which he calls The Threat of Death, um, which echoes some of the fatalistic ideas and feelings that are in the world right now. The poem goes like this. <clears throat> For safekeeping... Gold is hidden in a desolate place where no one ever goes, not in a familiar or easy-to-get-to spot. The old proverb says joy is concealed inside grief. The mind puzzles with this, but that strong beast, the soul, can break such tethers. Look for the answer inside your question. Cornered there in the edgeless regions of love, you will see the opening that leads not east or west, but rather within. For secretly within you, you are a mountain searching for its echo. When you get hurt, you say, Lord God, the answer lives in that which bends you low and makes you cry out. Pain and the threat of death can do this. They make you clear. And when they're gone, you can lose purpose. And this is because you are uneven in your openings, too closed and often unreachable. Too often your intellect dominates. And then the universal beyond time intelligence comes again. So sell your questioning talents and buy more bewildering surrender and learn to live simply and meaningfully in the place where your gold has been hidden all along. So that's Rumi going after this strange idea or dynamic in which the answer for many, if not most, of the burning questions of life are secretly held inside the person burning with the question. And there are many old traditions and many paths that lead to the same notion that what we need most when we're in great trouble is found inside ourselves. And along with that notion comes the idea that we are not really alone in the world. I know in the modern Western world, the idea is that we're each existentially on our own, but that's not the only idea about human soul about human presence, about the self of a person. The old idea is that we are not alone, but we are, in archetypal, in, in psychological terms, 
we can be inspired and empowered by um, the archetypes when everything else is falling apart. And one of the archetypes is the archetype of wholeness or the archetype of the deep self. And Jung's idea was that specifically when the world seems to be polarized and about to fall apart, that's the time when the self tries to manifest not in a collective way so everyone agrees on something, but on a deeply unique individual way so that each person winds up having something meaningful to contribute in terms of healing and finding solutions to these great dilemmas and seemingly impossible tasks that are now what we have inherited. So um, you could say that we're in a deep, wounded cultural condition part of which has caused great damage in throughout nature, um, and that this kind of upheaval in culture and nature cannot simply be contained by the individual psyche, and yet it cannot be dismissed either. We are caught in the dilemma. Because we are human, we have the capacity to imagine both tremendous loss and tremendous healing and renewal. That's the place where we're being put, it would seem. Um, and so the fragmentation and the polarization in the outside world is also felt deeply within us. Another old idea. Each soul is secretly connected to the soul of the world. So when there's turmoil in the world, the soul feels it. And that's why it's we can say we're going to turn away and yet we turn back again to see the next drama, the next problem, because our soul is connected to the world and is connected now to the deep suffering of the world. Um, and of course, as the accepted patterns in life get more and more disrupted, we become more and more vulnerable to feelings of insecurity, anxiety, and fear. Um, and one of the few ways to settle the anxieties and reduce the fears is to feel connected to a deeper self within. The old idea was that the soul is not defeated by disturbances in the world. And if we can be connected to the deep soul or the deep self, then we can be witnesses to what's going on, but not necessarily be overwhelmed by it, not necessarily become completely depressed by it, and not necessarily become overwrought with anxiety by it, but rather we can be tracking how our deep self would have us live in the midst of the catastrophe, let's say. So um, as the rational mind reels from all the irrational blows coming from both nature and culture, um, we are thrown, in a sense, back on ourselves. And if we don't have the idea that there's something enduring and deeper and wiser than our daily, regular self, then we can be really lost. Um, for one of the few things that can stand against this onslaught of radical changes that has become the way of the world right now um, is to feel connected to a coherent inner center, the deep center of the soul or the self, uh, which is what makes each of us unique in a strange way, but also what makes us uh, able to somehow contribute to healing and to even a renewal of the earth. Um, in other words, at this time, we are being called to expand our sense of identity to increase our understanding of what it means to be human in this world. Um, right at the time when it is most painful to feel what's going on in the world, we are being called to understand in a deeper way what it means to be a human being stretched between the heavens and the earth and capable of feeling uh, great loss and great pain, but also capable of imagining healing and renewal. So... In the midst of all this, uh, you might hear an inner voice saying, I can't handle this. Certainly I hear it repeatedly. But it's helpful to know that that's the ego speaking. For the ego cannot handle it. The ego has never been able to handle it. In a sense, the ego or the little self uh, 
is created to avoid the great troubles of life. Um, and so uh, then a person could say, well, wait a minute, I feel very smaller and smaller. You hear people saying that in the world right now. I'm just a tiny speck in an accidental universe. I think that's overstating it. We are each a tiny speck, but we are all secretly connected to the soul of the world at the same time. I'll go back to Rumi, who said something like, you say I am so small and I can barely be seen in all of this. How can there be a great sense of love and a great meaning of life hidden inside me? Friend, listen, look at your eyes. They are small, but they can see enormous things. So that's the ecstatic poet saying, remember that we have eyes that see big things. Actually, the old image is that we have the eyes that we are born with that open when we enter the world. And then when we are in great trouble, the t intention caused by uh, trouble and loss can cause the inner eyes of the self and soul to open. And those deep inner eyes can see what our daily eyes cannot see. In other words, those deeper inner eyes, when they open, they bring a natural vision that was inside each person that gives them their view of the world and begins to give each of us a potential understanding of what we are here to see and what we are here to become. In the meantime, those people who get their sense of self primarily from collective values tend to suffer a, a great identity crisis and a loss of the sense of self. And that partially explains the spread of extreme ideas, false beliefs, and conspiracy theories. That is to say, people who have lost their sense of self because it was connected to the ideas of the state or the nation or the government or some collective community, when those things are breaking down, the people who connected their sense of self and identified it with it, uh, collective values begin to feel empty and resentful, fearful, but possibly enraged inside. Uh, they have lost their self. They don't know how to find it or where to find it. Um, and yet, again, the old idea is, as things fall apart, the knowing self within moves closer to the surface and openings to a deeper understanding and meaning of life can be found. Um, so that's the maybe core idea, in a sense, of why the notion of the deep self within is most pertinent right now. In other words, the world needs to change, but strangely, real change has to begin inside before it can be manifested in the world. And that change cannot come from the ego or the little self, which is terrified and unprepared for what life is presenting. It has to come from something deeper. And so things that maybe used to be esoteric, that is to say more hidden, now may have to become more widely known. So another old idea that I happen to love is that the eternal energies, the energies of creation, keep trying to enter the world and can only do so through the souls of those people alive at a given time. So that um, the awakening of this, the inner eyes of the soul, the awakening of the deeper sense of self makes us capable of receiving and transmitting the eternal energies that keep trying to enter life. I don't think there's going to be a committee or a new idea or some kind of agreement that it's going to allow people to deal with the huge issues that are occurring right now. I think it has to come, as people used to imagine, from the other world. One of the old ideas was there's an other world right next to this world. It's the place of eternal things. It's the place from which all creation came. And when something is wounded in this world, it has to be healed from the other world. And that is an esoteric idea, but it might have to become a better known idea because I don't think the answers are coming from the structures or the patterns or the habits that we have for living in the daily world. So... Interesting and helpful to know that the knowledge of a deep 
self center and source of inner guidance has been known throughout the ages. People all over the earth have been instinctively aware of an inner presence that has been called by many names. The inner spirit, the philosopher's stone, was a title for the alchemists. Sophia, as the divine wisdom in each person, was another old idea. Uh, uh, this sense of the deep self appears with many names, I think, because it wants to be recognized by many people. Um, and so this off-forgotten inner center mm, is in some ways the unadapted, instinctive, indigenous self within us, sometimes known as the divine child or the eternal youth or the wise old sage secretly and uniquely and uniquely dwelling inside the heart of each person. I'm just naming the various names that are used to refer to this wiser, deeper, more instinctive and intuitive sense of self that people have relied on throughout the ages for guidance, for centering, um, and for orientation in life. In ancient myths, like the myth of Brahma in India, uh, Brahma was considered the cosmic spirit who was the eternal source of life and who breathes existence into the world. And yet, Brahma was also the deep self hidden in each person. And when it was referred to as the self inside or the inner Brahma, it was called the Atman. And so Brahma was the bigger than big and Atman was the smaller than small, but they were both connected to the source of life and being. Um, and so just as Brahma breathed existence into the world, the deep self is trying to breathe its knowledge and wisdom um, into us with each breath we take. So our true self, our deep self, hides within the breath of our life, which secretly connects us to the source of life if we follow the myth of Brahma. And again, the teaching from the ancient uh, world was when the earthly realm becomes chaotic, the place to look for centering and coherence is to be found inside the deep self where Brahma or Atman or the great spirit is dwelling as part of the natural inheritance of the human self and soul. So um, an anecdote or a story comes to mind. Um, for many years, we've worked with severely at-risk young people, um, girls and boys living on the street, homeless kids, gang kids, um, all kinds of lost souls in a sense. Um, and when we would bring them together, which we typically did in remote camps, so they could be feeling the healing breath of nature, which otherwise they had not experienced. But when we brought them together, they would often be in really rough shape, some of them still kind of having the effects of drug in their, drugs in their system, all of them having to be having been to some degree or another abused in many ways, um, we would have to get them to calm down and settle in. And one of the things that we did was have everyone lay on the earth, lay flat and still on the earth. Prior to that, we would have them go find a stone somewhere in the forest. And so they would have their stone and they would lay on the earth and we'd ask them to place the stone in, in their midsection and then simply hold the stone there and breathe down to that stone. Just slowly breathe to the stone and back and to the stone and back. And it was a simple way, but very effective for getting them to settle in and settle down. And there was no fancy introduction. It wasn't uh, an expo explanation of a intricate process. It was almost like, hey, this is simple. We're here, we're connected to the earth. The earth can settle us. A stone can bring our breathing. Remember, one of the names for the deep self is the philosopher's stone. We're basically delivering that knowledge to them without the intellectual apparatus. And it worked. And it can work now for anyone. I suggest it for anyone. You know, we all get uh, nerve, more nervous, more anxious, more fearful, and more concerned these days. It can happen in a moment. And, uh, and therefore, it's helpful to have little ways of getting reconnected to the deep self within, which at times is called 
the Philosopher's Stone or the Diamond Body. It has different um, titles that are related to the mineral quality that is deep within the bones and, the, and within the self. So another image that I carry for understanding and connecting to the deep sense of self comes from the Nascapi First Nation tribe, which still resides in the remote forests of the Labrador Peninsula in eastern Canada. Um, traditionally, the Nascapi live in uh, isolated groups far from each other and they hunt in small nomadic uh, groups or else in complete solitude. And, and somehow they have the tradition in which each person develops a bond with an inner guide and a soul companion that they call the Mista Peo, M-I-S-T-A-P-E-O, which means something like the great man or the great person. And this inner figure... Um, is revealed uniquely to each person who must then learn to trust this inner companion and spiritual guide. Um, and they believe that the great person within them is connected, like Brahma, to the universal source of life. And they more, the more they trust the inner guide, um, the more they receive big dreams and visions and the more wisdom and meaning they find in their lives. Um, so it's a, to me a beautiful image that these people that are nomadic and do not have fixed religious practices and ideas have this deep sense of, of a soul companion, of, a, of a, um, an imaginative creative self within that can guide them. Um, and maybe what intrigues me about it is that currently in the modern world, uh, we are often feeling separated from each other and sometimes, actually, it, we have periods of l literal social separation. And many times people are feeling very isolated and alone. Um, yet, rather than having the, an inner guide that we can turn to, most people turn to technological devices, which make people eventually feel even more isolated and alone. And so... I'm mentioning the sources of these ancient and immediate ideas of the deep self as the um, counter to the f sense of feeling really alone, isolated, and disempowered. Um, and repeating the idea that a genuine transformation of the world has to begin in the depths of the human soul before it can move into the outer world another old idea that I find valuable. <clears throat> so there's many images and ideas about something deep inside each person that is unique to their life, but also connected to the source of life that gives a capacity for imagination, for creation, and even for finding healing and helping make things whole. And so the problem is not that there is no notion or sense of the greater self. The big problem turns out to be that we also have a little self or ego self that also dwells within us. And that ego self or little self does not know there is a greater self deeper than itself. So in a sense, every person born on earth inherits the struggle between the little self or the ego self and the deeply knowing self within. And as long as this egocentric little self remains unaware that there is a deeper knowing self, then it acts as a false self. So, and not only that, but the greater the distance between the little self, the ego self that everybody has, and the deeper knowing self that everybody also has, the greater the distance between them, the deeper the anxiety, depression, numbness, and fear that we feel. So I'm saying in the world that is topsy-turvy, turning upside down, and full of extreme thoughts and feelings, um, we are more likely to feel the distance between the little self and the deep self, and that just intensifies the sense of feeling lost and being helpless and powerless and on the edge of overwhelm. So, um, unfortunately, the little self has to come to the realization that it is not 
the center of the world, that it is not even the ruler of one's own life. Unfortunately, the little self is like a false ruler on a shaky throne um, that remains insecure, yet requires heavy defenses against the notion that it is not in charge and not in control. Um, So somehow there has to be something that breaks open the shell of the little self. Uh, There's an old idea also that says that all the struggles in life are not there simply to harm us. They are there to crack the shell of the little self so that each person can open to the realization of a deeper, more knowing self within, which is also our human inheritance. So um, uh, you could say at every crossroads, a revelation of the deeper self and soul is close at hand, and yet at each turning point, the false self, the little self, stands in the way. Um, One way of looking at this is that the ego or the little self um, is originally created as a defense against helplessness in the face of abandonment and overwhelm early in life. Um, Under the fear of annihilation because um, our mother turns away or something happens that isolates us, we fashion a little self or persona in order to survive that early situation and to some degree or another in order to satisfy the needs of other people, the family. The family has needs. We have to fit into it in some way. And so we drift away from the deeper self and we begin to fashion this little self that protects protects us at first. Um, According to psychology, depth psychology, no one, there is no exception to this experience early in life where a person adapts um, to the situation in which they find themselves and begins to create the little self, the ego self, which can also act as a false self. Um, So um, the problem actually becomes not that we adapt. Humans are the most adaptive creatures on earth, apparently. The problem is that we all over-adapt and then we continue to adapt and usually adapt in ways that move us further and further away from the deep self that is really the thing we're longing for and needing in our life. And that leads to this old idea that what saves us early on will destroy us later in life. Who we think we are typically becomes the primary obstacle to our psychological and spiritual growth as well as the potential enemy of our health and well-being. So that's the battle between the little self and the deep self. And I'll repeat an interesting idea that turns up in myths and stories is that the crises that we experience, and now we could say that both individually and collectively, are not here to destroy us, but rather to break the spell of the little self and to break the spell of collective lives that are also imagined as small and not connected to the source and origins of life, Uh, that the crises we experience individually and collectively are here to crack the shell and break us open, to open the inner eyes of the soul and to give us the opportunity to reconnect to the deeper self which knows why we are here and what our life purpose already is. So I see that there are questions, so I'll I'll stop there. First question, is there a fairy tale or folk tale about the other world healing us in this world or trying to communicate with the world through the people in it? Um, Yeah, almost every fairy tale is about, um, first of all, fairy tale, the word fairy, used to be fated tale. Fairy tales are fated tales, where the the key people in it, the ones we identified with, um, are having encounters with their own fate, and they are trapped in a spell 
which you could translate as the spell of the little self. And then they encounter, you know, helpful animals or the wise old woman or the wise old man or the dwarf who gives them the information um, about where they need to go and what they need to do to heal themselves and awaken from the spell. And those animals, dwarfs, wise old woman, they're all examples of the deep self showing up to help us when we're in the crisis, especially once we accept that, and once our ego or little self accepts we don't have any idea what to do, that's when everything changes. Um, and so that's mostly the dynamic of, uh, of uh, fairy tales. And then there are numerous folk tales about how everything is falling apart um, and the wise old woman appears and, and reveals that what the secrets of life are and the key secret of life turns out to be the mystery of birth, death, and rebirth or birth, death, and renewal. And that's a, a potent um, imagination and necessary wisdom that's woven into many, many folk tales. Thank you. <clears throat> How do we crack the shell of the little self and still feel safe? Self, still feel safe. I love that question. Um, we don't. Um, there's an old uh, description. Uh, safety means um, to take the most meaningful risk at this time of life. Uh, safety is like um, too highly regarded by the little self. Um, and so... The cracking of the shell, as it sounds, it has a cracking, it has a breaking. And so um, there can, it's only relative safety. In other words, it's not to be foolishly endangered, but it's to be in the right trouble, you could say. Or another way to look at it is cultures used to provide rites of passage for the young people when they're leaving childhood to somewhat safely be held while the intensity of the experience of the initiatory rites breaks down the little self and what becomes revealed is the gifts and the wounds of each young person which then can be um, blessed, the gifts can be blessed and the people who have already been through this kind of initiation that reveals the deeper self within can, um, can also help with uh, the healing of the wounds that all the young people are carrying as they leave childhood and into the greater world. And so we've lost touch with the meaningful stories. Typically, I'm speaking generally about modern world. And we've also lost connection to meaningful rites or rites of passage or initiations, which would be how people would go through these deep awakenings and revelations of what's within them. One of the meanings of initiation is to reveal oneself to oneself with the guidance and help of others. Thank you for the question. I find myself disengaging from the world as a survival tactic. You're not alone with that. Relying only on my inner self is isolating. How do we connect with the deeper self of others? Well, that that's a complicated thing. But um, um, there's an old saying that... Um, we are only lonely when we are at odds with ourself. So the isolating experience that many of us have as members of the modern world is intensified by the lack of the connection that the Nescapi Indians, for instance, have to this uh, Mr. Peo or this spirit companion. Um, one of the things that has been lost, the understanding of it has been lost, is that we are not alone in the world, that we are uh, uh, companioned by the inner genius, the spirit of one's life, the deep self. Um, and we are also companioned by the energies of nature. Uh, you know, pe people used to be connected to the spirits and the sprites and the forests and at the streams. And that was a way of being interconnected with nature. The isolation of the modern person is, a, is an extreme form of dissociation from nature, from the cosmos, and from the source of life. And so, you know, that's something we have to work on. Once that changes, then the connections to the deeper self of others becomes um, easier and, 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 you know, m more profound and more common. So I'm suggesting, following all these old traditions, that the real work now is to awaken 
ourselves within ourselves. And we'll talk in a bit about ways to do that or ways that it has been done. Um, and then when enough people do that, then not only do we feel less alone because we're, we're inhabited by the genuine energy of our soul, we're connected to nature, but also people begin to be connected to each other and that begins to shift the collective sense that we're all alone and at the edge or the end of, of life. At the going through the inner journey, when do you know when to turn back to the outer world to serve and help? Does it occur naturally or does it need to be worked on intentionally? Of course, the answer to that is yes. But I'm joking, but you know what I mean. Um, uh, so when we're connected to the deeper sense of ourself, we're connected to the natural gifts that we brought into life with us. When we're connected to our natural gifts, the instinct to give them um, becomes obvious and, and easier to follow. And when we find ourselves giving from what has been given to us, we find ourselves both naturally and intentionally being uh, connected um, to the world around us. And so um, it's not as if uh, everything happens, you know, isolated from each other thing. We go inside, we get a feeling, uh, we get a vision, we get a dream, we get a, um, a whispering from the deep sense uh, which, of self, which we can call by all the different names, and then, um, and then we bring that to the world. Uh, you know, we kind of go back and forth. We're more connected than we think we are, and, and when that becomes more clear, the back and forth between the depth of us and the, and the presence of the world becomes more evident and obvious. Again, go back to Native American uh, traditions and there was an idea of the second soul and the second soul in each person was connected to nature. And so uh, a per person had to find the uniqueness of their own soul and then also find this other or second soul that was connected to nature. And, and then it becomes more fluid and more natural to be interior when interior is happening and then connect from the interior to the outside world. Thank you for the questions. What is the relationship between addictions, alcohol abuse, trauma, and the deep self? Good question. The greater the distance between the little self and the deep knowing self, uh, the more trauma uh, remains present and vibrating inside a person and then the addictions, alcohol and so on, are self-medicating to, to, to diminish the sense of extreme inner dissociation, let's say. And so, um, you know, the word addict has in the middle of it dict, D-I-C-T, which means to dictate, to speak. So it's as if the addict cannot quite pronounce the sense of self at all and the, the isolation coming from that and the feeling of imminent annihilation requires that something be brought in to medicate and, and, and numb that out. I mean, I'm, I'm just making a simplistic description of it. But um, so when that changes, when the healing happens, um, then what happen, What is occurring is the deeper sense of soul and, and self comes present. And, and, you know, they call it different things in the different uh, traditions of dealing with addictions and trauma. There's different names for it, but the general sense of it is the medicine for our own traumas and illnesses resides within ourselves if we can but open to that depth and accept that there's something so meaningful within us, which is hard to do if we've been abused and rejected and so on. But where else is it going to come from? How do you work with overwhelm and doubt? This is a lot to take in and connect with. Um, so two things about that. Being overwhelmed is not the utter worst thing in the world. It's just the worst thing for the ego. So, so the, the thing is, and it's the thing, I don't think the idea is to get rid of the ego. I'm not one of those people that says get rid of the ego because 
the ego usually has the car keys. You know, it knows if we paid the insurance or not. And all the ego is in charge of certain things, and it should be capable of those things. And so it's necessary to, necessary to have a fairly strong ego, and then necessary to let go of it. Um, and so um, I'm thinking right now, because of the question, makes me think of being creative. And to be an artist or be creative means to be frequently overwhelmed and often uh, to be experiencing doubt. Doubt is one of the human things. The people that don't doubt are actually um, usually hmm, very egotistic, narcissistic, and uh, overly self-involved and quite willing to mess with yourself. Um, and so to doubt is human. Um, to be swallowed by doubt means to lose connection to the soul. So things like I can't handle it or I'm dying with doubt, to me that's all the, 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 the ego or the little self speaking. And we have to eventually recognize the rather strange and unique uh, lexicon or language of our own little self and then realize, oh, that's right. There's something deeper. And I can hear that and I can feel it but it is not completely overwhelmed. I don't lose myself in doubt, and I don't become completely overwhelmed by the fears and the anguishes of the little self, which is there to avoid ever feeling doubt and annihilation again. I'm just repeating that idea. All right, so thank you for all those uh, questions. And I'm going to go back with some more material. There's no way to cover this completely. I'm just putting ideas and images out um, in order to stir the sense that we're in this struggle within ourselves and that working to deal with that struggle, struggle is the basis for changing the world. So I want to go back again to an old image. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was one. I felt compelled to write a book that I entitled uh, Awakening the Soul um, about finding the soul of the self in troubled times. And while ch trying to figure out how to begin such a book, I remembered um, the story about this fragment um, of a papyrus scroll that was from over 4,500 years ago that was discovered in a scrap heap in Egypt um, and then eventually got translated. And it turned out that the, the author of this papyrus scroll was an unnamed author who was feeling deeply discouraged by the state of the world in which he lived. And he found himself at the edge of despair and on the verge of suicide or self-destruction. And in this, one of the oldest stories ever recorded, he depicts his state of growing anxiety and anguish over the collapse of social life around him. And, and he was questioning whether life is worth living at all. Um, and then he, he realized he could ask this question of his, what was called at the time, his ba soul, B.A. soul, ba soul, which is another way of talking about this inner, uh, deeper self that is the companion of a person. And because he had this tradition of having the inner ba soul, um, he turned to it rather than feel completely overwhelmed or utterly isolated. Um, and he understood in some sense, he implies, that the ba soul knew more about him and the core images of his life and the aim or purpose of his life that he did. And in these fragments that somehow survived the ravages of over 4,500 years, there's an answering voice from the ba soul that tells him that he has to go back to the beginning of his life, that in going back to the beginning, he can touch again the potentials and the possibilities that exist within himself himself. 
And in doing that, he can recapture his sense of life and continue to live in a meaningful way until it really becomes the time to leave this world and go to the other world. And so there's a fragment from 4,500 plus years ago that people have been struggling with this this, um, inner a battle between the little self that is overwhelmed, disappointed, uh, full of resentments and fears, and the deeper self that understands that we can keep tapping back into the origin of our self, which is secretly connected, uh, as in the story of Brahma, to the origins of life itself. And in doing that, we then keep refinding our footing in the world, and we keep finding the paths of healing and the ways in which we contribute. And, and to me, it's amazing. Here's someone will never know the name of the writer, but someone wrote this down over 4,500 years ago, and it is completely attuned and valuable in terms of what we are experiencing now. This has happened before. It's been different each time it has happened, um, but it has happened before, and the wisdom of human intelligence at a deep level says, turn to the depths and the origin of oneself and find the footing and the direction and the orientation from there. And then we live the purpose and the meaning of our life. At any time in life when we are living a meaningful we don't, a meaningful uh, existence, we don't know when it's going to end. And so why would we curtail it now when it is most needed? So... Um, So the deep self seeks to become known and be confirmed. Um, And along with the confirmation and recognition of the deep self comes an increased awareness of the natural capacities of each person. And um, I've written about this a lot, but each person born is born with innate gifts that are intended to be given. And on the other hand, each person who is born is also wounded. And so this turning to the inside isn't like all is all's going to be glorious now. It actually becomes an engagement with the dynamic of gifts and wounds inside each one of us. And the trauma that was referred to before um, is really, again, the separation between the gifts and the wounds. Not to deny the intensity of traumatic experience, but also to suggest that Uh, As another Native tradition had it, the medicine and the knowledge we are looking for is inside ourselves, and it's often buried, like in the poem from Rumi, it's buried in the last place we want to look because we're afraid that in going inside we're going to hit those traumas and we're going to loop through the pain of it over and over again. And there needs to be something that encourages us encourages us to imagine that below that trauma is where the deep sense of self and soul waits to be found, having down there the exact medicine needed to recover from the trauma and find ways and methods of healing and becoming whole. So, in a sense, the little self must learn uh, that it's not the center of one's life, and that conflict, tragedy, loss um, are all ways um, that that push it to let go and therefore create openings for the deep self and soul to rise and to awaken. And those kind of revelations, that sense of loss on one moment and revelation in in the next, can be so shocking as to feel like death. That's why we often fear that if we really go in there, if we really face the things that we're carrying around inside, we will simply die. But it's the ego that dies. It used to be called the little death. Big death waits at the end of the road for everyone that's ever been born. But along the way, we're supposed to die little deaths, deaths of the little self, deaths of the ego that make a greater life possible. Uh, The Irish have a proverb that death is the middle of a long life, not the end of it simply. And so, and many of the ancient poets wrote about that. The things that we're afraid of often turn out to be the fear of the little self, uh, which fears its own dying. And in a sense, Dying little deaths is the only way 
we grow. So um, a key to all of this, it seems to me, is imagination. And you could say that imagination appears at the fateful border between the little self and the deeper self. That imagination is the key of how we inhabit that betwixt and between space and how we cross and recross the borderland between the little deaf, a little self and the deep self. Um, uh, you could say that fantasy um, is connected to the ego's needs and its unschooled desires, whereas imagination has spirit in it uh, that can open us to the wisdom of the deep self. Um, and so um, imagination is the, the great bridge between thinking that we're a little speck in the universe and realizing we're connected to the soul of the universe as well. Um, and so turning to the inner imagination allows the archetypal forces um, to aid us rather than uh, thwart us. And by archetypal forces, I mean we're already talking about the deep self, which is an archetypal energy and source and force, but also the archetype of creation. So as the world outside us is falling apart, the archetypal energy of creation is trying to enter the world through us. The time of uh, the word uh, apocalypse, which is used very casually now, originally meant collapse and renewal. So we're living in a time of collapse and a potential time of renewal, and the energy that allows the collapse to turn into the renewal is this connection to the deep self and the deep soul, and that requires an intensification of imagination. So... Um, I'm just thinking of where to go next. One more little idea occurs to me that the deep self is like the living library inside us that carries the exact knowledge and the inner medicine that we need. Um, and so the point isn't to become inflated with self-importance because we found or we think we found the deep self within. Um, really what I think is supposed to happen is the little self is supposed to become connected to and enamored with some project in life um, that can turn into a spiritual practice or an artistic path or a healing way to go. So that I'm um, going back to the idea that we don't get rid of the ego, but it needs to it needs to realize it's not the center of everything, and it needs to be employed as a project of the deeper self. Um, in depth psychology, they say it was the deep self that created the ego originally to get us through the fearful sense of annihilation that happens during infancy. And so then the ego needs to be brought back into the picture. It needs to be loosened so it's not holding everything so tight with fear. But when it loosens, it needs to be connected to a meaningful project. And so one idea is that we have to surrender to a path or a project that requires all of our positive, uh, positive energy while also bringing to light all the negatives and all the oppositions that exist within us. So we have to imagine committing ourselves, our little selves and our deeper selves, to something that transcends the, dis the tension and the opposition between them. And the ego begins to serve something greater than itself, which means the deep self, but also means the project that the deep self would have us undertake in the world. I'm just following these old ideas and, and suggesting that as everything is falling apart, that's the time to take up the deep project that ha has been woven within us since before we were born, that we are called in the midst of the most, the greatest upheaval to respond from the depths of ourselves and that the little self or ego self, once it realizes it's not the center and that it can't handle this, uh, then can let go and allow the bigger energies, the greater imagination and the deeper creativity to enter the world through us and then the ego can become in service of that. Um,
So in alchemy, this is called uh, the magnet of the self is one of the terms. And the, one of the images they use in alchemy for the deep self is the fish. Um, and it's one of the many images of the self. And the idea is that um, the unconscious um, is like a huge ocean inside a person in which there are many fish, just like there is in the outside ocean. Um, but one of them is the wondrous essence of oneself that's seeking to be caught by our consciousness. And in order to catch it, we need a project. In alchemy, it's called the theoria, like a theory um, on steroids or something, um, or a practice that is suited to our psyche um, and that allows a revelation of the inner core of our being. Um, so then... Once we find a project like that, where we have to wholeheartedly commit ourselves, where the sense of it and the extent of it is so deep that the ego realizes, no, I'm not in charge of this and I can't do this. Once we find that, um, then the ego has the possibility of learning how to recognize the presence of the deeper self. Um, and then we're on some kind of path. And, and then... The notion is, as our life changes, we may have to change and find another theoria, another practice, another art, another way of staying in touch with the deep self and finding our way through the world. And so the ego has to be loose enough to allow even the practices of the psyche to shift. Um, that's a key thing. If a person lives long enough, they have to find more than one practice in order to stay moving on the genuine path of life. So, um, eventually, in theory, in theoria, we learn to move the way the soul would have us move, and our eyes open more, the inner eyes of the heart and soul open more, and we see the openings in life better, and we, we more often... Uh, gather the courage to take the risks that make sense and less often does the little self out of fear and obstinance get in the way. Um, so in alchemy again, they talk about three levels of this experience and I'll just say them because they're kind of interesting. So we could call them the encounters with the deep self and the idea is that the first encounter is simply when the little self recognizes that is not in charge, that it cannot handle the dilemmas that are inside and the conflicts we encounter in life, um, and that it has to acknowledge there's a deeper self, uh, which can at times be experienced as a centering or a coherence within ourselves or a stillness that we find within which nowadays you can imagine is part of many of the practices of yoga and meditation and so on. But it's interesting. At the same time, at the center of the self, we can find this deep stillness. At the same place, in the center, we can also find an ecstatic sense of awareness um, with a capacity for great imagination and creation that allows us to have a greater vitality and has energy and imagination that wants to flow into life. So the deep self is really um, something that contains the opposites, including the opposites of a deep centering stillness and an ecstatic awakening creative energy that wants to flow out. So those both are can be experiences of the deep self, and they both can be and should be experiences where the little self realizes, whoa, this is deeper than I thought. There's a stillness that I never knew could be possible. Or on the other hand, this is ecstatic and so vibrant and so imaginative that I have to give everything I have to something of meaning and beauty and contribute it to the world. So, um, hmm. so it's difficult on Zoom if we were all together, we could begin to figure out who has had these experiences and, and how have they had them. And so right now I just have to give an experience of my own going back a long time. But I had uh, 
learned how to drum, playing hand drums, and become quite intrigued with it. And it strangely did that to me. It gave me a sense of stillness in the midst of the rhythm. I could feel so still inside myself. It was as if my heart went into that rhythm and everything was fine. And I was not afraid. I was tuned in and I was turned on to something deep within. I could feel it. I could feel it resonating in the lower parts of my body. And I was letting go of my, you know, kind of intellectual fears and that kind of thing by being tuned in to the drums and the heartbeat and the rhythm of the earth and everything that's involved in that. Um, and at the same time, I could feel the power of it and the ecstatic uh, energies that can come from a meaningful rhythm and the shifts of rhythms. And somehow during that period, I got invited to teach drumming. And the truth is, I had barely learned drumming. I certainly had never taught drumming. And I found myself, and this can happen in the ways of the world, uh, expected to teach drumming to 130, 130 people in a remote camp. And I had no idea how to do it. And yet, the next day, I had to start dealing with one-third of the group each day, That you know, 35 or 40 people, 45 people a day. And there were a bunch of drums. But honestly, I didn't realize until I got there that I had no idea what to do. And the time was coming just a couple of hours away. And someone had told me that deep in the forest there was a bend in the river where you could swim. And out of feeling overwhelmed, lost, and my ego just quitting and not wanting to be part of it, I wandered through the forest. I found that bend in the river. I jumped in the river without even thinking about what I was doing. And once I was in the water, I decided I was not coming out until I learned how to teach people drumming. And there I was under the water for quite a while. And somehow, somewhere in the depths of the water, which I would now connect to the depths of the unconscious and the area where the deep self, like a fish, could come swimming by, down there, I suddenly saw myself standing with my back turned to the people trying to learn, playing with my hands, the drum up in the air so that their hands could follow my hands. And that allowed me to recatch my breath, rise up out of the water, and I went and taught drumming for the first time in my life to about 45 people, and it worked. So there's an anecdote, you know. So, by the way, ever since then, I go into water, cold water and deep water, and often stay in there to see what's trying to come up. It's a connection I feel to the depth of the soul that I find often in water, immersed in water. Second level of the connection to the deep self as seen in Western alchemy um, is where rather than a fleeting experience, the presence of the self becomes a repeated experience. Um, and a person can just realize in, a, in the quickest moment, oh, that's right, there's a deep self, or oh, there's a deep feeling that connects to something meaningful, and it just starts to happen more often. And strangely, at that point, when the deep self is not felt, it can seem like a tremendous loss. And I'm, I'm saying this because it, it's meaningful when it happens. At first, it's like, wow, I can find this connection once in a while, and then I start to find it more. And this happens in... Uh, in, in spiritual practices, it happens in the arts as well. And, um, and then when it's gone, it's like, I am really bereft now. It's like a repetition of the isolation and sense of overwhelm that was there originally with the little self. And, and at this point, though, the little self has to help by remembering that there are times when I felt tuned in and grounded in the deep self um, and then that is what allows the deep self to come back. I hope I'm making sense. It becomes a different experience where the present, the absence of it is more intense than the presence of it. Um, and that can be like the surprising dark night of the soul come round again. And in that kind of dark night, now a person is no longer an innocent that doesn't understand the dynamic of the little self. At that point, there has to be a capacity to remember, I have gone through these dark nights before. I have lived through these isolations and these traumatic experiences before. And if I can recall some of them, then the presence of the deep self can come back. I'm just offering that as a really interesting experience. And then the third level, they say, is when the deep self uh, 
ceases to be a temporary presence and becomes more of a constant content, a constant companion nearby, like those nomadic uh, hunters in the forest in Labrador Peninsula, imagining that the great person within is is with them all along the way. And when a decision has to be made, they can turn to the deep self for inspiration, guidance, and, and so on. So um, those are three steps, just to a way to think about what a process might be. And most important maybe there is um, take some time in your own life to figure out, write down, paint out, um, talk about a time when you actually felt the presence of something deeper and more knowledgeable inside because that's a way of stirring the conversation between the little self and the deep self and the way things are going in the world, we're going to have many opportunities and needs to turn to the deeper self. Um, So in a way you could say at this critical time on earth, The real work of humanity may depend upon finding a greater sense of meaning and truth inside our own selves that can connect us to the deeper self and the hidden wholeness and unity of life that underlies all the divisions, all the polarities, and all the oppositions. Um, And as the connection to the deeper self in individual souls becomes more present and stronger, the connection of the collective group, the connection of the collective group to nature and even to the divine becomes greater. I'm saying that the collective changes by um, transformations occurring in the individual souls and I'm following old stories that suggest that any meaningful transformation moves from the inside out. And many people now agree that humans have been the cause of much of the damage in the world and the, if you move the little self and the ego out of the way, you realize anyone who has the power to cause damage also can have the power to heal, to cure, to repair that damage. And that's what I think we're being called on to do. And in terms of depth psychology and in terms of mythology, we do that by awakening to the deep sense of self and soul in ourselves and trusting that the gifts that we were given before we came to life and the wisdom that's hidden within us uh, can become conscious and be used to guide and help us find ways not just to heal ourselves but also to help heal the world. And when enough people do that, then the archetypal energies that are trying to enter the world um, can help with the restoration and the renewal without anyone having to be overly heroic or thinking they have come up come up with the only idea or the single idea that everyone needs to follow, what happens then is the changes in the lives of many souls of many people begins to change the collective and that begins to shift the imagination and the understanding. And if that happens, maybe humanity can come again to know its own deepest values and be, can become again a friend of creation or an agent assisting creation which is always trying to come back and renew the world as exhibited in the idea that the mystery of life is really the mystery of life, death, and renewal of birth, death, and rebirth, and that we, by being born, are part of that mystery which lives inside us and is known best by the deep sense of self and soul waiting to awaken more and more to each one of us. So... Maybe I'll stop there. I see there's questions. I'm currently moving into work. I feel it's my soul's calling. I find myself wavering between inspiration and excitement and feelings terrified. Is this a tug of war between the little self and the deep self? Any advice as I move through the fear? Yes, I would say that is the tug of war. There's one part of it. Um, that says, I can't do this and I shouldn't do this. Um, And that often takes the form of an inner critic. And then there's another part of it that says, you know, I know I'm called to do something meaningful. I've gotten glimpses of it. I can feel it at times. That's the tension. And then there has to be a kind of leap of faith in a way. 
You know, people think you grow out of childhood into adulthood. It's not what happens. Childhood is part of a developmental process. You can study that. But when childhood comes to an end, there's a leap that's needed to be made into the life waiting to unfold from within each person. And so um, that unfolding is the result of the calling. And the calling is calling to things that are already in there, the genius qualities, the hidden gifts, and so on. And at certain times, we have to follow the calling. And, uh, you know, if we don't, uh, in, in, in fairy tales, to go back to fairy tales, there's something called a fate worse than death. And that means to arrive at the door of death without having lived the calling of one's life. Here's another idea. As everything in the outside world falls apart, there's an acceleration of calling inside the human self and soul. Thanks for, thanks for the question. Um, here's another one. How do we reconcile the knowing of the deep self with the reality of life and its obligations? I deeply feel it's time to leave a stable job to study full time. However, I'm a sole mother of two teens with financial obligations and simply cannot do it. I do, however, feel my deep self crushed by the weight of obligations. Thank you. I can feel it just reading that. Many of us have been there, maybe not that I exact way but so yeah this is it this is the tension between the ego and the deep self between the calling in life and the obligations of the daily world that's it that's the struggle um and there's no clear path each person each soul is unique and therefore each path of awakening of learning of healing and growing is also unique um so i can just say as a one time single parent with four children, uh, I found myself getting up early and earlier every day to find some time alone in order, in order to, I used to, you know, just read stories and rewrite them and, and study myth. And I found that if I didn't do that, I was drowning in the obligations. And so there are those really diff diff difficult periods when we need, I would say two things, some kind of theory. In my case, I'm going to keep studying myth even if I'm doing it 4.30 in the morning for an hour and a half. Um, so some kind of connection to a practice, an art, a path of meaning and awakening. And then I would also say connection to friends of the soul. So we have those responsibilities for whatever reasons and, and however they develop and they're meaningful. Once we have children, we owe them all kinds of attention, love, and so on. But we can't uh, relinquish ourselves. And so um, what's helpful, I think, is called the uh, friends of the self. Friends that know us and understand the depth of us and how we have a calling and that we're going to get to it more you know, someday in the future, but we're staying connected now. There needs to be connections to the deep self of, the, of other people uh, so that we don't wind up being... Uh, drowning in the obligations and losing the connection to the inspiration and the imagination and the meaning of our own lives because we're, you know, the idea of being isolated as an individual parent or, or, or pair of parents with a nuclear family is a relatively recent idea and it puts way too much pressure and stress on the parents. It used to be that the child was a child of the community and they were running here and there and staying at other people's houses and they would get connected to an aunt or an uncle that had the same kind of spirit as they had. And people would realize that and say, oh, they're going to get nurtured from that other person, not just from me. So we're in an awkward situation in the modern world where there is much greater stress on both the little self and then on the parts of ourselves that are trying to respond to a calling. So uh, thank you for the question and, and uh, you know, blessings on you being a parent and everyone else struggling with what we struggle with. Anyone that thinks that the world is not going to be a place of struggle and, and, and intense uh, inner experiences is in some kind of denial. Um, is the dream state conducive for making contact with the deep self. What do you find helpful in doing dream work? Thank you, great question. Yes, the dream state is in the other world. Um, 
Dreams are the universal evidence that we all are connected to another world. And, um, and many traditional cultures imagine that uh, we could call it the deep self or you could call it the original self or the source or the ancestors are sending us the dreams in, in order to give us knowledge through the dream delivery system and in order to keep us connected with the source of life and the capacity for, uh, for psychic growth and, re and renewal. And so, and what do I find helpful in doing dream work? I've been writing dreams down for probably 45 years. I, I don't know for sure, but um, as often as possible, um, almost every day. And every time I do it, I learn something. But one, here's one thing I'll share. The, there's a danger of the ego or little self trying to occupy or co-opt the dream. And so one of the first things to do is to get the dream down as simply and directly as possible and watch out for the ego trying to come in early on and figure out what it's about. The trick with a dream is allow to the image, the image, the imagination, and whatever meaning is in the dream to come all the way in and open us up. And the ego doesn't like that either. And so a, a practice of dream work is a practice of separating the ego and the little self from the deeper self. And dreams can help show us what that little self is like. We get recurring images that uh, are actually revelations of the limits of our own ego self. My 17-year-old grandson, grandson who lives in another country is taking drugs. My son and his wife are naturally extremely worried and feel helpless. They've tried many ways, but nothing seems to help. Help! I keep checking within myself if there's anything I can do to support them. Any wisdom would be, uh, would be thankful for. Um, yeah, it's another one of those painful things about being alive long enough to realize how trauma and how pain moves through everyone's lives and that helplessness that can come. You're old enough to know something, but what do you do to help someone who's far away? And, and, and even if you were close, how do you interfere with things that sometimes are beyond one's control? Um, so I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I've been stuck with things like that repeatedly myself. I, I would say one thing, though. Um, two things, maybe. One is if I can help someone that I really long to help, I can always help someone else. And sometimes that shifts the energy. Not to let that desire and longing and willingness to help uh, to be, to dissipate, but deliver it somewhere. And then somehow maybe someone else steps in to help in the situation that I can't quite reach. That's one thing that occurs to me. In other words, live out the feeling and the longing to be helpful. And then the other thing that I learned I was raised uh, Catholic and then had to move away from that. Um, but I found myself going back to the idea of prayer. And it happened when, when my children were getting old enough that on a given evening, I could have four children out in the world and not know where any of them really are. And I, and I realized that rather than just being fearful and then getting uh, tight, wound up and, and so on, so that I'm not even present when they do come back, um, I began to pray again. And so uh, there is a really simple, beautiful thing of making a shrine for that person that we're most concerned about. And then it's as simple as lighting a candle every time we think of that person. And, and that act is not as simple as it would appear. It's like um, you make a prayer, and I don't mean a prayer that's been preconceived. You say the prayer that's on the heart. I wish my grandson to be safe and to be protected and to find some opening in his life that might um, take him out of the spiraling of, of the addiction, you know, whatever the words are. Putting it in the world, in a sense, changes things for oneself and who knows what else. But also, in a way, it's an acknowledgement of the deeper self. On my own, in the midst of the worry and the concern, I can feel just fearful and even can feel numb. But I light the candle, I make the prayer, I have the thought, I express the feeling, and all of a sudden, it's the deep self that's present. 
That's where that energy for healing, that's where that love and that longing is coming from. So those little acts are ways to just not be simply trapped in the ego's very predictable concerns and fears, but do something that is has beauty in it, that has creativity in it, and then and then and then take the next step of one's own life. <clears throat> A lot of this can come across as very individualistic. People can go perfectly insane by working things out alone. What is the place of the community or the tribe? So thank you for that. Uh, So the first thing that makes it not alone is the presence of the deep self. That's the first thing that changes it from being simply alone and going crazy in one's own style. Um, Then the other thing is just... And, and, you know, this has to come as a realization to each person in their own way. But I'll go back back to the idea that we each have gifts when we come into the world, and the gifts are intended to be given, and they're intended to be given to what we call the community or the other people. Um, And so the dynamic is um, without... um, Without gifts, a person cannot even be part of the community. And without the community, a person cannot live with their gifts properly. And so, again, we're going through a period where there has been a great forgetting about the meaning of the individual and the, and the essential uh, meaning of the community. It can't be one without the other. It becomes a little bit like the division between the little self and the great self. Um, so two of the big learnings that have to happen on one level, more of us individually realizing I have this ag- given gift, this ability, this, and, and even though I'm afraid and even though I've been rejected at other times, I'm going to find a way to give it. And that enlivens and uh, kind of um, generates something in the community. And the job of the community is to receive those gifts and acknowledge them and bless the, bless the person that's given them. So the two are deeply related. The gifted individual and the community each need each other. Um, one is the individual, one's the collective. But I want to go back to the one of the core ideas, that the change happens from um, transformation in the individual soul. That's what alters the community. That's what alters the collective. In other words, in this crucial time that we're in, when we all could use more community, um, our first responsibility still is awakening to and learning how to live from the deep sense of uh, self and soul. That that is the core transformational move. And then that contributes energy to the community and then, and hopefully then, the collective awakens from more and more awakening happening in individual souls. Uh, could the project of one's life be a strange, rare, deep illness? Well, that's, that's a painful question. Um, and I think the answer is yes even though I'm not sure what's being referred to. But the first thought I had was Helen Keller. Um, And I'm not sure if she was blind or just worked with the blind, but to me, she represents someone who uh, pioneered in in the idea of, in in the work of of blindness and said things like, um, sight is not important if you don't have inner vision something like that I remember from her. And I may have a bad example there. But I think, unfortunately, some people are fated to live very deep, agonizing issues that most people manage to not know about or avoid at any rate. And then that becomes one's fate. And in a way, there is this courageous move of accepting one's fate. Uh, And by fate... I mean the limitations that naturally occur inside each person. And and my understanding of it is that when we accept our fate, when we accept our limitations, which is another way of saying when the ego lets go and accepts reality, whatever it is in one's life, then what happens is we trigger the twist of fate. 
And the twist of fate is what connects us to the destiny. So the idea is that each person has fateful limitations. Nowadays, people talk about genetics and things like that. But it used to be the conditions of the soul that were being referred to. And everyone has the limitations that are the constrict constrictions and conditions of their soul. Once those are accepted, then the twist of fate comes into play. And the twist turns the limitations into a uh, an awakened connection to a destiny. Destiny, of course, refers to the destination of the soul. And it's a star word, destinare, Latin for of the stars. And so I hope it's true um, that if someone has a fateful physical illness, and it's rare, um, that somehow in accepting that fate, then the twist of fate can occur and some awakening or greater awakening to the destiny of that soul uh, can also occur. Um, that's my sense of it. That's, I think, where we're at. Because to ride on that, collectively, we are now experiencing the limitations, you could say, the fate of our collective world, of humanity now in its limitations, in its mistaken courses and so on like that. And hope, you could say, imagination, lie in the place where we accept that fate, we accept those limitations, and in doing so, we open de deeper potentials and possibilities that were waiting to be found once we accepted the condition we're in. And that reminds me of one other thing, which is a line from a poem by Ikkyu, the uh, Zen poet, who said what I think is an important thing, and I'm going to end here, or at least go to a poem after this, and that is to say, you can't help but be who you are and where. We can't help but be who we are and where. And in accepting that, we become potentially um, more connected to, more available to, and more capable of expressing the deeper sense of self and soul, which is trying to awaken to us every given moment. So I started with a poem. I thought I would end with a poem. <clears throat> I started with Rumi. I think I'll end with Hafez. Two little poems. One he calls Manic, my friend. We should make all spiritual talk very simple today. For God is trying to sell you something, but you don't want to buy. In this case, of course, God is another name for the deep self, the great self. Because God is trying to sell you something, but you don't want to buy. And that is the true nature of all your suffering, your fantastic haggling and manic screaming over the price. The price being a representative a representative of the sense that a sacrifice is required to awaken further. A sacrifice is required even to heal. The wound has to be exposed if it's going to be healed. We're usually hagging, haggling over the price while we're missing out on the healing energy trying to enter through us. Another little one by Hafez. Understand this. In the ledger of the world, each one of us is already marked eternal. Each of us already carries that brand. You may refuse and avoid that title now, but on the final day, it will be revealed in you. So why wait until then to learn what can be discovered in the depth of one's own soul in the here and now? So Hafez has the last word. Whew. So I'm inclined to sing. Often I sing at the beginning, and right now it's just occurring to me that I didn't do that. <laughs> so I want to sing at the end, and the, and the song that's pushing at me from inside comes from the Yawanawa people in, in South America. Um, and it's a song about how a bird of spirit brings people back together after they've been divided and separated, polarized, as we say nowadays. <clears throat> and to me, it represents... The 
separation that occurs inside between the little self and the deep self, as well as the polarization outside that's happening inside all human societies right now. And, uh, and then the bird of spirit becomes another uh, symbol of the deeper self that's trying to bring everything and everyone together. And that song goes like this. <clears throat> Canero ete ete Canero ete ete Canero ete ete Canero ete ete Canero no ma no ma 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 Canero ete ete Canero ete ete Canero ete ete Canero ete ete Canero no ma no ma 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 So, Conoro is the great bird of spirit, wishing that the bird of spirit, the spirit of life in the form of the deep self and deep soul, awakens to you often, visits you often, stirs the depths of you more and more often. May that happen. May it be true. Thank you.